Uh, and just with a show of hand, uh, let us know who you are. So we got Wim from PAX. Uh, there he is. Philip from IMAP. Hi. Nice to meet. James from Reach. Hi, James. Uh, Grega from Synergize. Thanks for joining us. And Vanessa from ICRC. All right, uh, without further ado, since we have a packed schedule, I want to jump right to Wim and, and start the conversation about his work. So Wim, while he decides to share his screen, I want to tell a little bit about himself. Wim was a student of mine from a training long, long ago, and we I have been fascinatedly following his work. Uh, he's currently the project leader, humanitarian disarmament at PAX. PAX is a Dutch peace organization. If you haven't heard of them yet, you definitely want to look up. Um, so Wim has been working on monitoring environmental impacts of armed conflicts to improve humanitarian response, uh, to help people with evidence further understand these situations. Um, Wim contributed to the Bellingcat Open Source Investigative Collective, which is a great feed there. And he's the author of various reports and paper on environmental issues in Syria, Iraq, Cayman, Libya, Ukraine. I think I can keep naming them. And special congratulations to him since he got the Green Star Award uh, in 2017 by UNHCR and UNA. Uh, without further ado, Wim, all, all over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rohini. And thanks everyone for joining. And first of all, yeah, I would like everyone to also to, to know that uh, Rohini was an inspiration of mine when I was doing this training at the uh, UNITAR on GIS and UNITAR response. And it was very stimulating as a, for me as an amateur on this field to, to explore all the opportunities for earth observation and remote sensing. Um, so today I want to quickly uh, dive into sort of the broad strokes of the work we're doing on identification and monitoring of environmental impacts of uh, armed conflicts, uh, why this is important uh, for humanitarian response, what opportunities there are for humanitarian organizations to do this, to, to improve data collection with limited and with maximum means, and uh, what kind of next steps uh, are ahead of us, and I want to do that uh, using a couple of examples from, from Syria and Yemen, the work we've been doing. But before uh, going there, um, I want to briefly introduce like why are we working as, an, as a peace organization on, envi on environmental issues. Um, the, armed, the impacts of armed conflict on the environment uh, can have direct and long-term uh, consequences for civilians and uh, uh, the environment they depend on. So we've seen from conflicts uh, starting off basically from uh, the well, most well-known examples, of course, with the Vietnam, with Agent Orange, but also more recent examples in um, Iraq and Syria and Yemen. We've seen there are direct health risks from bombing of oil facilities or industrial areas where, where toxics can expose people. Um, you know, people can be exposed to toxics and chemical um, hazards, uh, which have an impact directly on their health. Um, and having that kind of information, what's happening in conflicts, either in from the use of explosive weapons in populated areas uh, that targets industrial facilities or, or civilian infrastructure to long-term consequences where uh, destruction of the natural environment, for example, uh, deforestation resulting from collection of firewood because there's no energy, uh, water sources are getting affected from uh, solid waste or oil pollution. Um, we've seen collapse of environmental governance that, that limits uh, solid waste collection and safe storage or environmental regulations for dealing with industrial chemicals or um, other types of um, chemicals and pollutants. And there are long-term implications for climate resilience because it also limits state capacity to deal with uh, the climate impacts or uh, restoration and uh, building back uh, greener and better. So um, understanding these consequences is key to, uh, to prevent or to minimize the uh, impacts of military activities uh, on the environment uh, to protect people and to protect the planet. And I will do that uh, using two examples from uh, where we use um, open source. So we sort of started off because there was hardly any data collection on environmental impacts of conflict. Uh, UN Environment was doing um, uh, post-conflict environmental assessments, but either they were limited by uh, financial resources or it was often uh, years after the conflict and there was no capacity to during the conflict to do this. Um, with increased uh, uh, access to the internet, with increased earth observation means from Landsat the, the data, from uh, Sentinel programs from the European Space Agency, 
but also with people having access to um, the smartphones, taking images and pictures and sharing information online. We were exploring uh, either with Bellingcat or with Pax, like how can we use this to, during the conflict, to already monitor what is happening and that can help facilitate humanitarian response. So this is an example here from Yemen, where a local Yemeni uh, organization, uh, Old Makdar, um, published articles around the loss of dates. Apparently there were millions of date bombs in Yemen and they had this article about how that's they're rapidly declining. So what we did was we tried to identify which areas they were talking about um, and uh, trying to identify like how if we could sort of visualize the impact. And we were using uh, uh, data from, from uh, ex uh, existing research from uh, the World Bank, from the World Food Programme, uh, combining it with earth observation, we're sort of exploring uh, to, to visualize these impact and helping to put that on the on, on the radar of both uh, the international community and also uh, on the humanitarian community to uh, uh, push for more debates on how that's indirectly impacting lives and livelihoods, but also long-term what the consequences are. So um, here we've seen, for example, the date bombs there are already existing problems with, with uh, water security uh, in Yemen prior to the conflict. Uh, the ground fuel prices from the conflict had the impact on, on water pumping systems and irrigation because there's a lot of uh, you need fuel for generators to pump up the water. Uh, the same with herbicides and pesticides, which are also impacting uh, agricultural use. Uh, and farmers, of course, fleeing the areas from the armed violence or uh, unable to return because of UXO contamination in some of the areas um, that had also an impact on um, production uh, or the growth of forests. So, I mentioned there's, there was a wealth of data I've come across when I was sort of exploring, trying to understand what was happening there. So there's a lot of public data sets from, for example, the World Food Program, as I mentioned earlier, there are a couple of universities who did prior to the conflict, um, in 2015 at least, that conflict when it started, um, and later as well, trying to map uh, just the, uh, um, the, the croplands, the water use, um, and that's all giving, helps us building a picture of what's going on there. Um, this is an example from the from FAO, where they're sort of monitoring precipitation and droughts in the area uh, over the periods. So all the data is available online, and you can use that. So that's all help building the picture to understand uh, what the specific impacts are. And I could even find data from uh, peer-reviewed papers for specifically this area in Hudeda, where there's a lot of date palm forests and date farms. And that sort of helped understand a bit better uh what it is what we're talking about so i used here a sentinel uh two imagery from sentinel hub to just to look at the uh vegetation index and and trying to see where the key areas were based on the the words uh from the article and the locations and with support from more medium and high resolution imagery for example uh, google earth had a lot of updated high resolution imagery from 2020 all the way back to 2009 if i recall correctly probably earlier as well and you could clearly see sort of the decline of the date forest in, in this particular areas and also um and what i mentioned here like semi open access data for example um planet um, has been doing a lot of work on with the planet cubes to do remote sense to provide remote sensing data uh, and sharing that also uh, sometimes for free with researchers and sometimes it's public data is available for free which one can download uh, and use to uh, to identify the change in, the, in agricultural use. So on this case study particularly looking at who data we, we quickly explored like how much of that uh, area was affected um, and how much of dates bombs had disappeared there. Of course why they disappeared we couldn't directly answer in all the cases but like I mentioned in the beginning, all these sort of examples helps building the picture and also helps building to understand how it impacts livelihoods. Uh, the second example I want to use is about Syria. Um, I'm just focusing in this case just on the oil pollution in Syria. There's a lot of other environmental dimensions of the conflict in Syria, which can be addressed. For example, we're currently doing a massive study on deforestation in Syria. Um, and But this part will be looking at um, oil pollution, so the west, uh, so the east and the northeast of Syria, there's a lot of oil exploration. Uh, since the um, the conflict escalated from a peaceful revolution into full-scale war in 2012, uh, access to the oil fields uh, was um, severely limited. And uh, after ISIS takeover, the coalition started bombing 
the oil um, the resources there to prevent ISIS from gaining revenue. Um, so there were over 4,000 attacks on oil installations, but also the general decline of the oil infrastructure resulted in frequent spills, incidents, uh, makeshift refining, um, which also had an impact on uh, direct people being um, exposed to oil pollution and toxic fumes and toxic um, or hazardous chemicals produced in the process, but also uh, water resources, agricultural land, um, there were frequent spills. And we try, we're now currently finishing a new report looking on how to, uh, how to use earth observation and remote sensing to monitor the, or to identify and quantify the scale of the oil pollution. So um, we're looking at, for example, like the, the makeshift refining, um, which can be picked up relatively easily with a medium high resolution imagery to identify the clusters of refineries. Um, and on the ground, we've been working with local partners to get a sort of sense of how it's impacting their lives. Um, and livelihoods, um, because a lot of those areas are agricultural areas. So we're currently exploring, um, for, this is a case study from the northeast of Syria at the Romalian oil fields, where it's relatively easy with Google Earth imagery to um, look at the specific, uh, to do some visual interpretation of oil pollution around pumping jacks, uh, oil spills, and we're currently working this uh, to apply machine learning to quickly identify soil pollution. So here's an example from Oli Bellinger. He's an Oxford PhD student who has been working with us to develop a machine learning application to look at oil detection spills and to see how we can quickly use oil uh, that sort of project here to, uh, to um, quantify the amount of spills. And um, we're also using the um, uh, like the visual interpretation for to identify oil lakes, to identify refineries uh, or oil facilities where there are continuous leaks. And I think that all, that all helps understanding the impact of the oil pollution, how it impacts uh, rivers, uh, soil, there are frequent floodings of agricultural lands, and there are literally, and I've been to this area myself, uh, all the rivers of oil flowing there because waste is being dumped, there's no facilities, there's no capacity to repair it and restore it. So that's a major issue that will echo along into the future. So uh, to round, to sort of uh, close up and give more space for questions. So why are we doing this? And, and uh, what's interesting to explore a bit further is uh, we would love to sort of build a community of practice here where we can identify some of the key areas on how to address environment, peace and security through uh, means and methods to, ident to identify environmental pollution. Uh, to bring in experts, more expertise, so there's a lot of young professionals with, with amazing ideas that um, uh, can help building sort of the knowledge base and the expertise, uh, and uh, that can be helpful for humanitarian response, for, for building better data sets. How can we build toolkits and sources and methods? Um, and how do we share this information? How can this information be helpful for policy discussions on environmental dimension of armed conflict? And, uh, Vanessa from the ISRC will talk a bit about that a bit more because identifying and visualizing kind of issues helps pushing also the political discussion on responsibility and accountability for environmental pollution uh, from military activities and, um, and for cleanup and also for reconstruction and rebuilding in post-conflict work. So if we have this data available in this uh, already available after the conflict, then hopefully uh, funding can be um, used for uh, remedi remediation and reconstruction work um yeah so this is i think this and this seminar is a good opportunity also for for people to to, to uh, engage and to follow up on this uh if you want to have more information please drop me an email or you can follow me on twitter um and uh, here's a link also to the uh, pax website if you want more work on what we're doing and i'll leave it at that and I'm looking forward to uh, questions and comments and discussion. Thank you, Wim. Thank you so much for that inspiring note. Uh, I have a question from Chris Doyle. Is there, is there communication with governments, including militaries and civilian agencies that have indigenous or deployable electromagnetic spectrum assets? I'm guessing he's saying remote sensors or remote sensing instruments um, or thinking air breather and space assets to use raw data by UNITAR and so on. Is, is there a community of practice is, is this question that directly links to your next one? Uh, while I ask on Philip to see if he could show up sharing the, sharing the screen for the next one. All right, well, it's, it's to you. Um, 
that's uh, a level uh, of um, remote sensing application I have not looked into yet. Um, but maybe um, other panelists have some thoughts around that. Like I, I couldn't answer, we do use, for example, uh, SAR data to look at oil pollution in uh, mostly on, on water, because it can, it can easily be used to detect water um, pollution. But um, I think that also that le- that's kind of a question I would love to have other experts to engage on, because it sounds fascinating. It's something we have not looked into yet. But thank for your question. And if others in the panel later, can, we can just keep the question for later. Of course. Absolutely. Um, all right, we're moving on to our second speaker, Philip, Philip Frost. Uh, he is currently the head of GIS and remote sensing for IMAPS Middle East and North Africa office. Uh, Philip is joining us uh, from Amman, Jordan, and as a GIS coordinator, he's managing all the GIS remote sensing unit, along with conserving all data and products furnished by the unit. So Philip has also been tasked with a very interesting assignment, a development of an overall IMAPS strategy centralized on the collection analysis and visualization of Earth observation. I'll be looking out for that one. Uh, Philip, over to you to share your experience. Thank you very much. Um, can everybody hear me? Just let me know if the sound is fine. Loud and clear. Wonderful. So I'm Philip Frost. I'm the geoinformatics lead for IMAP MENA. So I'm here in, uh, in Amman in Jordan. And I was I'm decided to stand behind this, in front of this beautiful map of Syria today. Uh, we won't use a virtual map. We'll try and use a, a real map. And this is, in fact, Aleppo, which I might uh, be referring to. I feel like the weatherman today. Uh, talking to you. Uh, so the best way to describe data cubes, and I'm going to be talking around our work around data cubes, is to look at an example what Australia has done. Now, this is a continental scale map looking at water observation from space. So imagine you've got a system that's got all the Landsat data for 34 years, all packed, processed into a single open source environment. You've got an algorithm that can run at every pixel or 25 kilometer resolution, extract that water surface, 300,000 scenes being processed. And within around three hours, we can provide a long-term record of high resolution, high resolution, I mean with Landsat type resolution of water features across an entire continent. from there, one can derive all kinds of new features, uh, uh, water extent, change over time, and so forth. This is just a little bit of the power that open data cubes can provide us, and that's what I will be uh, talking about. Just to note, who's IMAP? We're an international NGO uh, in the information and management, uh, with information and management services in the humanitarian and development sector. We've got offices uh, all around the world, and geoinformatics is one small part of what we do uh, around the globe. So I'm making a statement today and I say the impact of earth observation today is still very limited in the humanitarian sector. Coming from other sectors, knowing how earth observation is being used, I do believe that it's still severely limited. And part of the reason for that is due to the fact of, I think, delays and inefficiencies in being able to access all of these big data sets that we have these days, complexities in data preparation, lack of efficient tools and so forth and so forth, not being able to scale. These are all massive problems that we're dealing with, uh, which is a limiting factor, especially to people that are not uh, specialists in the field of earth observation or remote sensing. So 10 years ago, uh, Digital Earth, uh, actually Australia, Geoscience Australia started this process of development of a data cube to look at exactly that. How could they better mine the Landsat long-term records that they have in play? So what are data cubes? They are three-dimensional data arrays that's stacked on top of one another. And the concept of the uh, data cubes are specifically around the the production of ARD, so analysis ready data. So making sure whatever data set goes into this data cube, into this database, is processed to the optimal level, geometrically, radiometrically, atmospherically. It's all in place. When you run an application, you can be sure when you look at change detection, you're actually looking at change on the ground and not change in, in uh, in sensor specifications. So, What is the goal of IMAP? It is to develop the uh, world's first open data cube focused specifically on the needs of the humanitarian development sector. We've got Google Earth Engine, we've got a lot of systems out there, but none of them are specifically focused around the needs of the humanitarian sector. And we believe that open data cubes can fulfill that role in providing analysis ready data and products to the broader community. If we look at our ecosystem on the left side, we'll see the data cube itself. It contains a number of different products, Sentinel-2, Landsat. We can do Google Earth Engine link uh, index into the data cube as well. And then it's wrapped with an analysis layer from which we can do machine learning. We can do uh, statistical analysis, such as the one that I showed on water. And from there, 
continuously produce products, anything from urban change, crop identification, crop condition, water analysis, and so forth. But the important bit of the ecosystem is how does that feed back into our thematic programs? How do people actually use this data? And at the end of the day, how do we look at doing field work uh, and feed that field work that we get off the ground, the assessments that's being done on the ground, how do we feed that back into the system that we can improve our, our models? So that's a key component of what we're trying to set up. Important features of our ODC is it's based on the latest uh, core and the latest code, a most optimal system. Uh, we've looked at the best workflows of Digital Earth Africa, as well as the Digital Earth Australia systems, as well as the Swiss Data Cube. And we've combined this into a new system, which we believe is one of the most robust data cubes out there. In terms of Sentinel-2 processing, we've gone the extra mile. In terms of true ARD processing, we do not use Sent to core but we uh, use a system called Force, which give us a lot of additional capabilities, for instance, improved cloud detection and being able to co-register our Sentinel-2A and 2B data on top of the Landsat grid, which makes a massive difference at the end of the day if you do um, compositing. If we look at our deployments around the world, uh, these are our current operation centers. And with the beauty with the data cube is it's centrally located at Amazon in the US, but we can deploy products from within our cube and instances for regions that we are um, running and having projects for. So currently we've got a, a big uh, cube running across Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, uh, which includes everything from the long-term 40 years of Landsat, Sentinel-2, nightlight population information, and similarly, as we have projects uh, such as the one in Colombia and Venezuela, our projects in, um, in Southern Africa, we just mapped the entire Okavango Delta, or projects uh, in Sahel, we can very rapidly deploy the data cube based on the needs of a specific project. We can deploy through indexing overnight, um, 40 years of Landsat data for a region, to the project and then revert back uh, without need of extra costs or saving huge amounts of data that's not necessarily being used. If we look at our applications, it ranges from agricultural and food security, land productivity, urbanization, logistics, water resources and disasters. And it's not limited to these, but we focus for now on these main applications. And here the SDG indicators such as land degradation, the one on urban change comes to mind as well as uh, water quality and uh, water extent uh, mapping. I'll uh, show a few examples now of these. First being the SGD 1131. So this is where we look at land consumption rate over population growth rate. The beauty of the cube is we can deploy this for any city across uh, Syria. And that's why I showed the example of, of Aleppo. Here we've got Aleppo between 2017 and 2020. And the question, what is the indicator value for Aleppo? Uh, on the right, we've done an urban uh, change map using Sentinel-2. We use the NDC model to get an urban surface, impervious surface. There we calculated a negative 1.2 square kilometer reduction in total urban surface uh, between those dates. On the left, we look at the population growth rate between 2017 and 2020. And there we can see there's been almost 1% increase overall in population. And for them, there then we can do the calculation, which then comes to the point where every new person at uh, the moment is consuming a negative 65 square meters of land in total. Now, I have to say, these are not perfect figures. We're working at, on, on coarse population data, and even on the urban side, we're still improving and fine-tuning it, but the methodology is in play, and as we improve our input data, our output will obviously improve as well. Another example is being able to do a very rapid uh, urban change map for any of these cities as well. So, uh, we are... Uh, busy developing the user interface. The whole idea with the user interface is to create a very simplified methodology for people that don't know much about Earth observation to engage with our data and derive basic products. People might not necessarily know the difference between Sentinel and Landsat, but they know that they are looking for a water layer. Uh, in this instance, what we're doing is we're calculating a fractional cover. So fractional cover just gives a uh, three components, the photosynthetic active part of vegetation, non-photosynthetic uh, non-active vegetation, as well as bare soil. So each pixel is broken up into three components, which is very useful if, when we want to look at crops or so mapping crops and looking at potential planting and harvesting. In this instance, it's as simple as defining a square, defining the time range that you're interested in looking at, choosing the model that you want to run. And in this instance, 
I define the fractional cover as the as the algorithm to be uh, processed. And you will see now within a few seconds, it will produce for that area then a fractional cover. The beauty of the fractional cover is it can be applied anywhere. It's a spectral unmixing model. Uh, it's not NDVI, so it's much more robust. And we're able to apply this kind of methodology anywhere around the world without any need to uh, do any adjustments. And there we have got our fractional cover. The green indicates actively growing vegetation and crops. And the blue would either be urban or non-active vegetation with red indicating base soil. And from there, one can download a GeoTIFF and take it further into a GIS. Looking at examples of floods, 2019 had lots of flooding. 40,000 people uh, were impacted by the floods alone in Hasika. Arisha Camp was totally destroyed in 2019. That's high resolution map on the right showing the tents underwater. By using something like the data cube, we're able to look at any specific area. In this instance, we went back to 2017, basically asked the cube to just extract all the information that's currently available on how the camp was developed, when it was developed, how it was populated, and by when did the actual flooding take place. In this instance, you'll see how the camp has grown in size. This is on the western banks of the Hasaka Lake. And what you'll see now is beginning of January, uh, beginning of 2019, you'll see the flooding that starts to take place and basically take out most of that camp. With this, we can do an automated water extent classification. And one can imagine the value of this, looking at every um, IDP camp that is in proximity of a, a water feature. Then some more examples, the Turkish state, um, currently is reducing the amount of inflow from uh, the Euphrates River from southern Turkey into northeast Syria, which is creating havoc in terms of agriculture as well as um, hydroelectricity. We got uh, news of about 50% uh, reduction in the, the general flows of the Euphrates. So using the data cube, we were able to look at the area, uh, as you will see right on this borderline between Turkey and northeast Syria, what the Sentinel, this is Sentinel-2 data clearly shows you is the dramatic decrease of water, total water body extent, uh, especially from the beginning of September, where it has dropped by more than 50% in, in total. So these kind of applications allow us to very rapidly respond to verify um, these kind of uh, articles and, and news information sources that come about, and then also look go back in time to say, but is this not a pattern that we see every year? How does this compare to 2010? How does this compare to 2015? Um, so the type of impact that we can assess uh, is really irrelevant for these kind of applications. Another current example, uh, Northeast Syria as well, it's going through a severe drought. Uh, this image shows the border between Syria and Northeast Syria between Turkey and Northeast Syria and the top, the northern part, you'll see irrigated crops. This is also a fractional cover. High end vegetation uh, due to the irrigation, the water that is being reserved in, on the Turkish side that I just showed being used to support uh, the crops. There's been very little rain since January in these areas. And on the southern side, you'll see that most of the dryland, so these are rain fed crops, in fact, failed at this point, uh, which is a massive problem. If we look at the statistics, the bottom left image shows the current conditions, the current total area under crop for the whole of Northeast Syria. When we do the calculations, we only calculate about 75,000 hectares of area under crop. Compare that to uh, 2019 for the same area and the same time, we saw 1.27 million hectares uh, under crop. Uh, this is uh, rather shocking at this point. Uh, but at the top right, we also see the phen phenological curve and the bottom little sliver is the 2021 data and what we see in terms of the productive state of the vegetation itself, uh, on top of the total area that has been planted, we see a less than productive state, even worse than the 2018 season, which was the worst drought we had in 18 years. So looking at this kind of data, just puts into context the severity of the agricultural uh, crop production for Northeast Syria for this year. Then lastly, just looking at new application developments, product developments that we look focusing on for 2021. We believe the, the cube has got immense value. Uh, we just heard in the last few days about a locust outbreak in uh, the southern parts of Syria, as well as in Jordan. 
So I think this kind of technology can, can be extremely valuable to look at yield, uh, at locust predictions and monitoring in future. We're also looking at an improved version of the nightlight monitoring using the black sky data from, uh, from NASA, uh, not just the NOAA data. And then also a number of improvements related to water quality as well, well as tree and health monitoring. And with that, I'll stop for now. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Philip. Um, while I could ask our rich colleagues to get started on their screen sharing, I have some interesting question for you here, Philip. Uh, one is from Teresa Dearden. How do data cubes tackle areas with persistent clouds and making temporarily relevant analysis in these places? Yeah, uh, that is a very good question. And we actually had this test where we compared our system with the Google Earth engine over Lagos, which you would know is uh, an area which is immensely uh, problematic when it comes to cloud cover. The first thing is to both use a Sentinel, for instance, when we look at Sentinel 2A and 2B, is use as many scenes as possible, make sure that those scenes are perfectly co-registered. But the true value that we found is the use of geomedian compositing. So uh, geomedian compositing versus a standard median compositing approach allow us to have much less clean data, so to speak, and still be able to produce a highly valuable, highly accurate uh, compositing product over long periods of time. So within the data cube, we've employed, uh, developed this geomedian compositing methodology now. We've tested it over regions, which normally is a massive problem, and we have we found really, really good results. The other thing that we're looking at is the cloud masking side of things. So there we really struggled in the past with same to core. So with the force processing now, there's an enhanced F mask that's being used for cloud masking. That's got a lot more depth in the methodology that, methodology that it uses to detect cloud uh, and to create different masks and different serious masks, uh, cloud shadow masks and so forth. So combining all of those is, is I think extremely useful for us uh, to test as well in different areas. And we'd be more than willing to share this information and look at uh, collaborating with people on this. Thanks, Philip. Thanks there. In the interest of time, we'll move to uh, James now to hear more about reach experience and come back to the questions later towards the end of the session. So, uh, James, it's all to you. And I would like to quickly say a few things about you before we go on. Uh, so, James is Environment and Human Security Specialist at REACH. Uh, by the way, REACH is one of my favorite organization. No favorite them, but I, I do have one. Um, and he's serving as the focal point for Ukraine. He leads REACH global camp activities on filling information gaps in the humanitarian response on the multi-sectoral needs of those displaced in camp and camp-like settings, and works closely with UNHCR, IOM, the clusters, and OCHA as well. In addition, he supports Impact Reach globally as a specialist in disaster response and risk reduction deployments. Uh, so over to you, James. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, yes, yeah, so I'll be presenting today uh, uh, from Impact uh, as part of the Reach Initiative um, and specifically on behalf of the 3P Consortium uh, in Ukraine. And today I'll be looking at uh, some examples that are, uh, you know, geospatial and uh, remote sensing examples from more of a, an emergency response, emergency uh, preparedness perspective, working with the humanitarian response in Ukraine, as well as working with our national and local uh, authority counterparts. So I'll be looking at two examples, one using remote sensing applications, specifically zooming in on wildfires and supporting uh, the state emergency services. And then two, I'll be looking at how we're utilizing the flash environmental assessment tool by OCHA and UNEP, um, combined with satellite imagery and geospatial analysis for preparedness and contingency planning. In, in Eastern Ukraine, uh, we're working on many different applications in remote sensing and specifically related to the environmental impacts, uh, uh, everything from drought monitoring, uh, extreme temperature and cold waves, heat waves, uh, air pollution, uh, many different applications uh, that remote sensing can be uh, extremely useful for, especially in, in armed conflict uh, where it's extremely uh, dangerous uh, around the line of contact. But today's uh, next few slides will all focus mainly on wildfires as the major hazard that uh, Eastern Ukraine was facing in terms of uh, 2020 and 2021. Uh, a little background, um, in late September and early October uh, of last year, wildfires burned to over 20,000 hectares of forest. 
Uh, it caused 11 deaths, 19 injuries, and damaged or destroyed 500 houses and 1,800 buildings. It left several settlements without power, water, and killed hundreds of livestock and poultry, and it spread. This was one uh, major event, but there were several wildfires throughout the, 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 the summer period, uh, destroying even more hectares, thousands more hectares of forest and, and affecting even uh, more communities. Impact first supported through, through remote sensing and, and geospatial analysis by uh, providing direct support to the state emergency services of Ukraine. Uh, we provide emergency rapid uh, mapping, uh, where we where we essentially were, were utilizing the NASA firms uh, active fire data, but then bring it into a, a more operational scale uh, uh, for the response colleagues, and then bringing in other layers of information. So, what are other useful layers of information? Knowing settlement location, settlement boundary, settlement population figures, uh, roads, electricity, transmission stations, and wires. Of the line of contact. As I mentioned, this is a, an area that's very close to uh, daily conflict incidents. It's also an area that has uh, explosive remnants of war and landmine contamination. So all these other layers of information can help provide a comprehensive situational overview for uh, those emergency response uh, responders and, and, and uh, those who are in the decision-making leading the, the command operations. So this is a one example. Now, after the emergency response phase, uh, there's a lot of interest from the state emergency services to explore further geospatial analysis, to explore further the powers of remote sensing and how they could utilize this. Uh, so together, the, we, we worked with, uh, with uh, the state emergency services with support from, uh, from our donors, ECHO and, and uh, USAID on how we could utilize the Copernicus Emergency Management Services uh, specifically for early warning. So looking at the severe fire weather, um, which allows the opportunity to increase the community engagement leading up to those uh, severe periods of fire weather forecasting, as well as monitoring the active wildfires uh, and wind conditions so that they can be better prepared um, uh, for their response coordination. So just to show a few examples of some extracts from the Copernicus Emerging Management Service, I won't go into too much detail because I'm sure my colleagues will give more information on, on this platform in, in the Sentinel Hub, but uh, you can see here that we can already see that Ukraine is in a significant drought period. Uh, there's a specific climatic anomaly that was being experienced in Eastern Ukraine uh, and a specific uh, high or severe fire danger forecast from the fire weather index. Um, in the Luhansk Oblast specifically. And when we overlay the active fire data and, and uh, land cover of, of forest land cover, we can really get a, a, a comprehensive picture. But how can we use this for early warning and, and, and to better prepare those authorities and community engagement uh, in, in these communities? In regions, well, if we look at an extract of the Copernicus Emergency Management Service, it's very user friendly um, and there's a lot of wealth of information. If we look at the region that was impacted by the wildfires in, in Luhansk, uh, circled in yellow there on the map, uh, at the, back in July, and we look at the fire weather index, which is, which is an index based on the meteorologically uh, based index on, on fuel, moisture, and wind. We can see it's a very low uh, fire weather index back in July. If we fast forward to, to September 25th, about a week before the, the wildfires began, um, we can see that that region was in a, a severe uh, state in terms of its fire danger forecast. And then if we fast forward a week later when the active fires begun, we can see these active fire points in green and there's dozens of active fires specifically in those areas that were were uh, being reported to have a higher severe fire danger based on that fire weather index. So this is definitely an informative tool and we had a, a good response feedback from the state emergency services on how to use this for early warning and monitoring and then to increase that community engagement during such times uh, of high fire weather. This also led to further uh, exploring further opportunities. So how to utilize the Sentinel Hub, um, which can help identify the wildfires uh, across a large geographical area 
and provide precise GPS uh, coordinates for, for responders, um, access uh, mapping for the responders, as well as identifying water source to in nearby areas for, for fighting a more effective uh, a fight against the fires, as well as how to utilize the Sentinel Hub for, for burned area analysis and post-disaster. So just an example from the Sentinel-2, uh, the Sentinel Hub, uh, there's a Sentinel-2 image here. Uh, it's great because it's it's free, it's uh, accessible to, to anyone. Um, it's quite timely, it's multispectral. So you have uh, the ability here with the near infrared and short wave infrared bands uh, that can help with penetration of smoke where you can easily identify those hot spots several hotspots across a large geographical area. This is just a zoom in, the wildfires were even at a much larger geographical area. And also you have the ability to, to put your uh, a marker down and extract those specific GPS coordinates of those hotspots. And this is without even downloading any information or doing further mapping or geospatial analysis, which is very uh, useful for, for the end users uh, of this information that they can extract uh, information that they can inform their, their decisions and planning uh, immediately. Obviously, you can download this extracted and do further uh, mapping and analysis as you need, uh, but this is a, also an extremely useful uh, tool for, for large-scale wildfires. Um, as well, as well, you can download the imagery, do post-disaster analysis, uh, look at burned areas with the Sentinel imagery, uh, quite high resolution. Uh, for one of the fires in July, it burned 5,600 hectares uh, that was calculated. Uh, so there's, there's several wildfires and, and tens of thousands of hectares uh, impacted in this region of Luhans. The, the second big... Uh, hazard in eastern Ukraine to both the environment and, and human health is, is uh, hazardous infrastructure. Um, you may know that the Donbass region of, of eastern Ukraine is one of the most industrial areas in the world uh, and is facing daily conflict incidents. Here we're looking at uh, mapping out those hazardous infrastructure facilities, which is uh, openly available by the Ministry of Environment. Uh, recent conflict incidents um, in the last few months, as that's constantly changing over the years, uh, as well as the environment and human health exposure distance based on those facilities and those chemicals, as well as settlement information. And give an example here, uh, in, the, in the table, we can see that in the last three months, three and a half months, there's been a significant increase in conflict incidents within a thousand meters of the coal preparation plant in Horlivska. Uh, this is definitely a, something to flag as a concern, uh, considering the, the industrial facilities uh, and chemicals that are present there. Uh, and this is an increasing, an increasing trend of concern. Uh, we can also see the water filter station in Donetsk was previously had 91 conflict incidents within thousand meters uh, of it. And there's no surprise that eventually it was hit and it is damaged um, when you're exposed to that many conflict incidents. And this just shows what type of, of uh, critical infrastructure and hazardous infrastructure is exposed uh, constantly to conflict incidents and that risk that it possesses. And this gets into now utilizing the flash environmental assessment tool. Uh, how can we use this information plus satellite imagery plus geospatial analysis to make a more comprehensive situation or refer decision makers, uh, as well as inform preparedness and contingency planning. So I'll give you an example here where we look at uh, a Zelote coal mine uh, in eastern Ukraine and the, and the major hazardous substance present is, is methane gas. Uh, and methane gas, according to the flash environment assessment tool by OCHA and UNEP, is uh, uh, human health uh, concerns uh, up to 300 meters exposure. Um, and uh, you can see here that analysis uh, run, and you can see specifically those uh, residential shelters or neighborhoods that would be exposed to that, uh, that area. If we look at the second hazardous substance um, present in the coal mine, it's the waste tailing, or waste from the tailings, uh, which is a, a, a toxic liquid. And according to the same feed to guidelines, 
uh, with 20 kilograms, uh, depending on the quantity, it could uh, be an impactful to human health uh, from one kilometer to environmental impacts on to soil and rivers up to five kilometers. And here we can start to bring other further layers of information. Um, so again, looking at settlement locations and those population, where those industrial facilities are, where are conflict incidents, where are the rivers and water bodies, where are schools and hospitals. And we can start to develop a more comprehensive analysis and situational overview, which will then, which has then been utilized by our 3P consortium partners, such as acted in the Ukrainian Red Cross as well as uh, intercluster coordination uh, groups for developing contingency plans, working with those communities, uh, engaging on preparedness and awareness. Um, and this is a, it's definitely, a, I think, a, a meaningful effort given this current circumstances of, of conflict incidents, uh, the industrialization of the area, and the potential of increased tensions, um, as you probably all are monitoring and heard in the news uh, potential flare-up and conflict. And then moving forward, uh, looking at uh, utilizing the same methodology in disaster response, uh, the, the Beirut blast uh, reached supported remotely the UNDAC mission to the Beirut blast, doing a similar analysis. Very, you know, 24 to 72, 72 hour window, there's a major need for information, some quick analysis that can be done uh, looking at how much ammonium nitrate was present, where was the site location, what is the concerns, the health concerns of ammonium nitrate, what is that feet exposure uh, for ammonium nitrate, um, and which neighborhoods would be within that uh, specific uh, radius of concern. And just to show another example of how this can be used, uh, not just for preparedness and contingency planning as in Eastern Ukraine, but can also be used for rapid information products in, in a response as well. Thank you for your time and happy to answer any questions afterwards. Thank you, James. Thank you so much for the interesting presentation. Really appreciate it. Uh, while I asked Rega to see if she could start sharing her screen, I have one quick question from an interesting name, magician. Um, what is the delay time for the satellite image for wildfire detection? Um, so he's asking if there is a fire happening next to me right now, how long will it take for me to get an image of the fire? Uh, a classic question. So the, the active fire data from NASA firms is, is much more readily available um, within you know, every 12 hours. Uh, the imagery from the Sentinel Hub um, and specifically the Sentinel-2 imagery where you can have that smoke penetrating image that I showed, um, this is, this could, you, you may have to wait uh, two or three days for this image, which is, um, which is a, a limitation. And this is why I don't want to go into too much details, but uh, even between the NASA firm's active fire data and the Sentinel uh, data to identify uh, hotspots, uh, there are limitations. And we're talking about an emergency response of fighting fires. Uh, they need more uh, timely uh, information. This information is definitely good for uh, a large scale uh, disaster or wildfire. And that's going to take uh, many, many days uh, to, to respond and monitor from a large regional or national level. At the localized level, though, we are equipping the emergency teams with drones, with thermal cameras, um, and they're utilizing this remote sensing technique specifically for more rapid information uh, to keep uh, their awareness of, of fires, but also their response personnel safe in such an armed conflict where you have landmines um, in the area. So it's a, it's a bit of a, a complementary effort. It's both, yes, there's a remote sensing benefits um, uh, that can be utilized, but there's also other remote sensing techniques like equipping uh, UAVs or drones with thermal cameras and, and utilizing both uh, in the same response period. Hope that could answer the question. Oh, thanks, James. Uh, so now over to Synergize. Uh, I think this has been a game changer. Uh, we have Gre with us Grega today, who is the CEO of this uh, a company, a Slovenian company specializing in software for advancing geospatial applications. Most of you probably would have heard of it. Um, so with his colleagues, they have recognized the potential of open Copernicus Earth observation data very early, uh, but soon hit a wall trying to use existing technologies to work with these large data sets, which I think many of us can remember from a few years ago and, and uh, share some notes there. 
Uh, so deciding to do something about that, Sentinel Hub was born, a Copernicus Master's award-winning service for processing and distribution of satellite data is exploiting this AWS open public data sets. So Gregor, without further ado, over to you to, to let us know a little bit more. Uh, thank you very much. Can you just confirm that you can see my screen and hear me? Yes. Yep, okay. loud and clear. Thank you very much. So um, yeah, um, I'm Gregor coming from Synergize and let me share some more details about the Sentinel Hub and the EO browser, which is maybe the easiest way to interact with it. Now, um, I mean, as it was mentioned already today, a couple of times, we now have really a ton of satellite data available. Uh, and this here, we're talking about open and free satellite data. Uh, now, in, in recent years, mostly represented by Sentinel data, but we shouldn't forget about the uh, USGS Landsat, which uh, basically started all this open data policy and was really important. And maybe amongst the most important ones uh, are these satellites. I mean, there are more. Um, and, uh, uh, but so Sentinel-2 is probably most visible for everyday uh, work. Uh, it's 10 meter resolution every five days. Uh, then Landsat, very similar one, just a bit worse resolution. Uh, we'll come to eight days or, or also in the in, uh, beginning of next year. Um, Sentinel-1 is interesting because it's radar and this is going through cloud. So in the cloudy areas, you can do many things with Sentinel-1, but it's radar. So it's difficult to work with it, more difficult. Sentinel-3 is interesting because it's daily and it has a, a sun thermal band. So you can actually use it also to see wildfires on a daily basis. Um, whereas uh, with Sentinel-2, as it was mentioned, uh, you can only see the data every couple of days, right? Five days, two to three days, depending where you are, how lucky you are. And Sentinel-5P for emissions, uh, this is interesting. Now, maybe one important thing to clarify here. Uh, so Synergize is a company uh, and we, we don't really operate these satellites, right? These satellites are operated by European Union or Copernicus program. Uh, European Space Agency is doing the technical uh, parts. We really are only uh, operating Sentinel Hub, which is uh, a commercial service, uh, which makes this data easily accessible, right? So just to, so that you understand that we really are only responsible for a small part of what I'll be showing. The, ma the main part of it was done by uh, European Union, really, and USGS in, in US. Now, uh, how to make use of all this data? Because here we are talking about tens of terabytes of data um, uh, every day, really. So, um, it, I mean, if you want to work with it individually, you'll have a problem, but there are luckily tools available and I'll, I'll, do, I'll show an example of the EO browser, which is hopefully the easiest way to use it. And I'll, I'll do it on a, an example uh, that was tweeted, I think a week or two ago uh, by Wim. But I mean, you can make this kind of example yourself in a couple of minutes. So when you come to the EO browser, this is what you see. Um, you, uh, and the first thing that I typically do is that I write uh, here the coordinates of the location that I'm interested in, latitude and longitude, or I can just search by uh, the, the, the place name, right? And then I come to the area. Then the next thing I do, I typically click search uh, where so that the, I see the data. Uh, the, the, by default, you are searching for Sentinel-2. Here you, you see you can search by all the other missions. Sentinel-2 is the easiest to work with, which is why it's default, but you can go to any other one. Uh, you, you find the, the one of the dates that is not too cloudy and you click visualize and you see something like that. And then you zoom in to the area uh, that you are interested in so that you get a bit better uh, view in it. You can zoom into natural resolution, right? 10 meters. Um, and then the next thing that I typically do, I want to see the activity, what's actually happening there. And for that, the easiest way is to use the time-lapse uh, tool here. Uh, the moment time-lapse is disabled because I'm not logged in. So what I need to do, I click here, login. And I have to put in my uh, username and password. Now this uh, EO browser is uh, free of charge for the non-commercial use. So to get an account, you basically just sign up with your email and that's it, right? You don't need to pay anything, no credit cards, nothing, nothing. Um, now, what, once you uh, sign in, you can then uh, use these tools and uh, you get a kind of the area selector for the time-lapse. You, you click play, then I, you select the start date. Uh, now I want to go before 2016. And for that, I need to switch to the level uh, 1C data. So now what we see here is atmospherically corrected, but the, two uh, the, the level 1C, which is non corrected, goes a bit further down uh, to 2015. And then I can select the, the start of the Sentinel-2. I select it, and then I click uh, search, and then I wait a couple of seconds, couple of tens of seconds, depending, depending how large your uh, area is and how long the time period is. And then I see the result, right? I, I can uh, turn off the individual scenes, but I can immediately start looking at the time-lapse 
as it is here. And in this case, you can see how there are some roads uh, uh, beginning here and that you can see some um, uh, activities happening. And this gives me a feeling now what to focus on further on. Uh, now, I, if I want to just export this uh, time lapse, uh, you can just click here to download and export it as an animated GIF and then do whatever you want with it. Again, the data are open and free, so uh, you can, the only thing that you need to worry about is to credit it, right? To say this is Copernicus data, and that's, I mean, that's more or less it. You don't need to worry about the licenses and stuff. Uh, if you want to uh, get, get a bit of an idea about the terrain, you have here the option to do the terrain, and you can just, you know, use it in a typical 3D fashion. Uh, to get a bit better, you can export this image uh, as well as you want. Now, if you want to, once you find something that you find it relevant uh, or newsworthy or whatever, you can click here to do the export of the data. You can uh, type in your title and then you simply click download and you get the data. Um, now, if you want to work with this uh, data further on, you can use the analytical export, which will give you an ability to export in either KML, if you want to, for example, export it in Google Earth, or GeoTIFF if you want to work in QGIS, right? And then uh, one thing that, uh, you, uh, that you need to uh, be careful is that the area shouldn't be too large. I mean, you can only export at, uh, um, to, uh, 2,500 by 2,500 pixels. So that is about 500 square kilometers with natural resolution. Uh, if the area will be larger, you will just have to uh, download in a smaller resolution. But you can zoom in and then simply um, yeah, export it many times. Once you export it, you can immediately import it in QJS or any other JS tools that you're used to to work with further on. Now, um, uh, another interesting feature is uh, compare. So uh, if you click here to compare, uh, it will go into the compare tab and you can select different dates and put them all in the compare. And then you kind of have all this uh, nicely settled here. And then you can just use this slider to compare data, right? So that you see what was happening. Uh, and, the, and another thing that you can do is you can uh, add this to pins. Pins is kind of a repository of the locations and visualizations that you like. This is stored on, on, on your account. So the next time you come, it will be there. You can also export it or you can share it with uh, your friend. So like when you find the locations that, you will, uh, that are relevant and the, the dates that are relevant, you simply pin them and then share them with anyone uh, with a simple link. Uh, we have a repository of these pins uh, uh, full of nice pictures and you, you can contribute to it as well. If you need to tweak the visualization a bit, like uh, if the, 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 the colors are not right, you have here an option to, to change effects, uh, um, play around with the, uh, the image, tweak it so that you, 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 it looks better. Now, if you are a bit more advanced, you can use the uh, different visualization options here um, where you can uh, choose the, because this is multispectral imagery, right? It's not just true color. You can really uh, look at the near infrared or whatever. You can click custom here and then you can combine your own visualization by just uh, dragging and dropping the bands. Or if you are more advanced, you can click here custom script and then you can copy paste the custom script that somebody else did uh, to create, for example, wildfire visualization, right? This was prepared by Pierre Marcuse and I mean, it's really elaborate one. Uh, we have a repository of this script so that, again, you don't need to start from scratch. There are about 300 of them here. So you just find the one that is most relevant, copy paste it, and you start working on it. And you can get these kind of nice images directly from the uh, application uh, without, yeah, without any processing really on your side or these ones. Now, sometimes you do need to get a, 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 higher, a, a bit higher resolution. The 10 meters is not enough. And we do have integration in place with Maxar and Airbus data. Now, this is where it stops being free, right? Because you need to pay for the imagery, uh, but still it is quite cost efficient to, to do so. Uh, and it's nicely integrated. What you do, you just select an area, you copy paste this area into GeoJSON, you go to another tool that we have in place, not yet fully integrated, but it's still easy to use. You copy paste the, the area here, you search for the data, you find the thumbnail, ah, this is too cloudy, uh, this one will be better. Uh, you click order, you order it, and then once you, when, I mean, once you order it in a couple of minutes, maybe a couple of hours, depending on uh, how long it takes on the Airbus site in this case, you get the data in Airbus and you can do everything that I showed previously, but with the very high resolution data. Now, if this sounded too complex for you, there is a tool that is even more simpler to use called Sentinel Playground, uh, where you basically just go there, search for the location, change the date, and that's, I mean, it has less features, but it's more simpler. Now, if you want to get more advanced, uh, you can do it. Uh, you can get the data directly in the QGIS as an example, uh, using the OGC services. 
you have a uh, we have a plugin that you can interact with it so that you can find the right dates and so on and then do whatever analysis you want to do with it right uh, or you can use it in machine learning for, uh, processes. Uh, we have an open source Python tool, you learn, which is really making it easy to, to use that. Uh, as an example, machine learning, uh, um, uh, um, result of the machine learning. Now, if you are using it in this way, you might actually have to pay something because uh, there are costs on our site, but it, it's not expensive, right? To here, what we do is that we uh, monitor 15,000 bodies around the world and it costs less than 100 euros a month to, to operate this the full the full service. So I mean, uh, it's not it's not expensive. But even with free stuff, you can get most of the work done, uh, such as creating nice uh, newsworthy uh, images that you can then share uh, or let others share them, uh, or do some serious research finding relevant information that are hidden in the Earth observation data. Uh, this is an example where, where Greenpeace uh, used the service to map all the wildfires in Russia. Um, here, these guys mapped uh, penguins in, in uh, uh, Antarctica with uh, the use of the Sentinel playground in this case. And this guy, the, I mean, this is a really crazy story. He used the EO browser to find the hiker which was lost in US and the, the hiker posted this image and then this guy found the, uh, the, the, the uh, location of the hiker by just comparing the data, right? I'll conclude here. I'll just invite you to the uh, custom script contest which starts at the beginning of May, 3rd of May. Uh, where you can play with the data and uh, uh, create nice visualization and actually win a prize and the commercial data aside. Thank you very much. Some links for further in, uh, uh, information and uh, happy to respond to your questions if there are some. Thanks a lot, Gregor. Uh, very fascinating. And personally, I think I learned quite a bit. And I think there was one question to see if there are any tutorials, but perhaps we could uh, share some of the links that you had shown. Uh, while we wait for questions from uh, some of our participants, I do have one for you. Um, given you have been in the industry for a while now and have seen many different applications, um, what, what, do you, what would be the main message for, to a humanitarian organization wanting to make use of this data? Uh, do you have any advice or notes that, that we should take note, uh, we should have? I, I mean, the main message I would say is that there really is a ton of data available that is super valuable, but super underused, right? Um, and it's available free of charge. I mean, not just in your browser, there are other places. And I think that we really should start using the data and we should start using the data in a way that we don't just show images, but rather that we uh, give interactive uh, um, options to others so that the other the people can explore this further. Because I believe that only if we start all of us uh, really understanding what's happening with our, our planet and the Earth observation data are really, I mean, the objective truth of what's happening, right? We can then start changing our habits. So I would just say, use it as much as possible for any possible means and just share this with as many people as possible because everyone in this planet, on this planet, should, start, should use this daily. I totally agree. I think we have a lot of information out there that is being underused. Thank you so much. So over to our last speaker for, for the evening. Um, I'm here with Vanessa Murphy, a legal advisor at the International Committee of Red Cross, where she works on issues including women, gender, sexual violence, and armed conflict. Um, her experiences before ICRC includes litigation on behalf of survivors of childhood sexual abuse, the running of support services for survivors of domestic violence and human trafficking, and work for organizations including DCAF, Human Rights Now, and International Criminal Law Media Review. Uh, she also contributed to writing the updated military guidelines for protection of the environment in terms of armed conflict. When I must say, it's a um, uh, very interesting field of work where you're in, and we can't wait to hear more from you. Over to you. Great. Thank you very much, Rohini. I hope everyone can see my screen and can hear me okay. Yes, great. Loud and clear. Perfect. Um, so what I would like to, I think my job today and what I would like to talk to you about in the next 10 minutes is sort of making the link between data collection regarding environmental harm and conflict, and then specifically what obligations there are on parties to armed conflict. So those who are fighting conflict to take data into account to reduce their own environmental impact. So I want to do this in, in two ways. So first of all, just do a very brief introduction to what the obligations on fighting parties are. So on um, their obligations under international humanitarian law. And then second of all, zoom in on three specific obligations that parties have to take um, environmental data um, into account. 
I should also flag before I begin that in keeping with the ICRC, so the International Committee of the Red Cross's bilateral approach, I'm, I'm not focusing on any specific context, but rather focusing more generally on the rules applicable to all fighting parties. So it's really not context specific, but zooming in on those specific obligations that they have. So to begin, um, first of all, to introduce international humanitarian law, it's often referred to as the law of armed conflict. And um, sometimes a little known fact about it is that it does contain obligations that relate to the protection of armed conflict. So what that means is that parties who are fighting, be it a state or a non-state actor, have specific obligations to reduce the civilian impact of military operations and of attacks. And that includes taking the impact on the natural environment into account. So to promote the implementation of these rules and strengthen compliance with these rules, the ICRC rele um, released last year our guidelines on the protection of the natural environment in armed conflict. And so these rules are supposed to um, strengthen compliance with the obligations in particular by um, being a reference tool for parties to armed conflict and other actors such as humanitarian organizations who may be called upon to promote and implement or have dialogue about these rules. So really what they're intended to do is facilitate the adoption of quite concrete measures by parties fighting on conflicts to improve their understanding of the environment and how to minimize their impact on the environment as they fight. So I think one of the things uh, that's quite specific here is that what I'm speaking about is the type of environmental damage that flows directly from the actions of military actors, so military operations um, or attacks both direct and indirect um, effects, but nevertheless, that type of environmental damage and conflict, rather than the broader type that we often see, and that I think some, some of which we've discussed here. So um, I'll also flag that the guidelines are available on the ICRC website for anybody who's interested, and I'm going to kind of zoom in on three of the guidelines here, but there's, there's 32 different rules and uh, recommendations for parties to armed conflict. So going to the first of the rules, it's up here on your screen. And this is the, uh, the rule is that the use of methods or means of warfare that are intended or may be expected to cause widespread long-term and severe damage to the natural environment is prohibited. So this rule is, what it does is it establishes an absolute ceiling of permissible destruction in armed conflict that prohibits widespread long-term and severe damage. So that uh, is a legal obligation. It applies um, in international armed conflicts. That means state to state conflicts and also um, arguably in non-international. So also applying to non-state actors armed groups, basically. It is found in particular in the additional protocol one uh, to the Geneva Convention. So uh, there's a few things to say here that first of all, that is a high threshold. So widespread long-term and severe damage, but though it is a high threshold, what we do know and what is certain is that in assessing the degree to which damage is widespread, long-term and severe, current knowledge about the effects of harm on the national environment must be taken into account. And that is actually quite a powerful development because when that rule was first negotiated in, in international law in the 1970s, the, the types of um, environmental damage that I think the humanitarian community, but the world community and states themselves understood was much more limited. Whereas now we have a much more sophisticated understanding of, of how long-term, how severe um, the effect can be on the environment. And therefore the assessment of whether damage is widespread, long-term and severe, um, therefore uh, is, is much more, is deeper. So to comply with this obligation, so the obligation is not to cause widespread long-term and severe damage and conflict, those who are employing methods or means of warfare must inform themselves of the potential detrimental effect of their planned actions. And what that means is they must assess all damage that is reasonably foreseeable at the time of their planned action based on the information that is available to them on, in all sources. So in a nutshell on that first obligation, widespread long-term and severe damage is prohibited. Warring parties must inform themselves of the potential environmental impacts of their actions. And they must inform themselves based on re, um, what damage is reasonably foreseeable at the time, based on information available to them from all sources at the time. So that is the first obligation I wanted to, to highlight. The second is not, not entirely different. Let's see if that's the third. The second is what we refer to as the rule of proportionality in international humanitarian law. 
And so what that rule says is that launching an attack against a military objective, which may be expected to cause incidental damage to civilian objects and civilians, including the natural environment, which would be excessive in relation to the concrete and direct military advantage is prohibited. So in other words, if the incidental damage outweighs the military advantage of an attack, the attack is prohibited. So to assess this again, similarly like with the previous obligation, parties need to assess the expected incidental civilian harm. And this includes taking into account the attacks direct and indirect. So sometimes we refer to it as reverberating effects on the natural environment or the environment. And that reasonably, um, so basically the effects that are reasonably foreseeable based on the assessment of information from all available sources to them at the relevant time. So the scope of that obligation to get into a little bit more detail is to take also into account the indirect effects of an attack and the related question as to when an indirect effect is reasonably foreseeable is very fact specific, but it also depends on information informed by past practices and empirical data, such as we have been ex um, just getting into a lot of very specific detail about. So basically the empirical data that is available, if it is available to the parties at the time, they need to take that into account as they are planning their military operations and attacks. That is the second one. The third one is related to the previous two. It is what we refer to as the obligations of precautions. So precautions, precautionary obligations to reduce civilian um, harm, civilian including the natural environment. And so this rule is in the conduct of military operations, constant care must be taken to spare civilians and civilian objects, including the natural environment, and all feasible precautions must be taken to avoid and in any event to minimize incidental losses to civilian life, injury to civilians, and damage to civilian objects, including the natural environment. So one of the specific precautionary obligations that is um, very relevant here is that each party to the conflict must do everything feasible to assess whether the attack may be expected to cause excessive incidental damage, including to the natural environment. So in this vein, the ICRC guidelines that I referred to provide that prior assessments of the potential environmental impact of an attack need to be conducted whenever feasible. So what that means is that when planning attacks in or around areas of particular environmental fragility or importance, but also in urban environments, which certainly cause a lot of damage to the environment when they are attacked, um, the, when planning attacks in these areas, this is when looking at what information is, is available becomes incredibly important. And this is why making the connection between the types of data availability that we've heard about just now and what information is available to the parties um, fighting, fighting in those different environments becomes really critical and why it's so important that actually the information that you're talking about is increasingly accessible and increasingly um, yeah, open, open to many different parties. So in, I have one more slide and basically what this does is just uh, highlight by concluding that what we as the International Committee of the Red Cross are increasingly talking to parties who are in conflict about is that they should, uh, a key recommendation which is set out in the guidelines, which is that they should adopt and implement measures to increase understandings of the effects of armed conflict on the natural environment prior to and regularly during military operations whenever it's feasible and operationally relevant. So as I say, increase the increasing availability of data on environmental impact, such as that we've heard today, is really an incredibly important link and valuable contribution to reducing a civilian harm, because I think it, it is, uh, it's an area that is increasingly um, understood and increasingly spoken about and, and um, focused on also within, uh, within, within within the priorities of states and parties to armed conflict who are, who are active at the moment. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Vanessa. Um, in the interest of time, we have 10 minutes. So I'm asking all our participants, if you have any questions, feel free to use our Q&A uh, to ask any of the panelists. Uh, I would probably start with Vanessa, uh, just a quick question from myself. Uh, I think it was very curious, very new perspective for me as well. Um, 
where do you see the added value in remote sensing in terms of improving states policies around protection of the environment? You probably touched base on that a little bit, but do you have any specific notes on that, uh, on how it links to the policies in the government? I don't have any specific notes on it. I think in terms of remote sensing, I feel like what, what the key is, is making the data more accessible and more widely understood. So basically there's a higher chance of that making it to the right decision makers at the right time. And I think the benefit of what we've seen with the, some of the remote sensing techniques is they're just more, more accessible and discussed in the wider community. And what that does is I think heighten general awareness of the environmental impact of conflict and it makes it more likely that I, the decision makers who are who are planning military operations will take that into account. Uh, just to follow up, I have a question from Mohammed Salim here. How did ICRC communicate these guidelines in the case of a civil war to multiple actors? So in a, in that's a very good question. So we refer to um, civil wars as non-international armed conflicts. So what that means is a conflict between a state party and a non-state actor, so an armed group. And what, how we communicate these guidelines is, is through our confidential and bilateral dialogue. And what that means is that in trainings that we conduct with armed forces, um, or, so in trainings preventively, we raise awareness of these rules to say that the environment must be taken into account. And then where there are specific incidents, we then follow up bilaterally and confidentially to, to discuss specific incidents when they happen. Oh, thanks. Thanks for sharing. I uh, hope that answers your question. And a uh, gentle question for anyone on the panel, so whoever wants to take it. How do you balance the need for data and information with protection of sensitive data that you don't want to fall into the wrong hands? Uh, do I have any volunteers who would like to take up on uh, data sensitivity, which is a huge topic in the humanitarian sphere these days? Well, I think something that I can say is um, we live in a different era now where data is freely available. And if we look at satellite data, for instance, where before only a few countries had satellite data and they had the option of obscuring, for instance, for military purposes, certain certain zones, which which was just blanked out. And uh, the world has changed to the point now where so many countries have their own satellite data. It's freely available everywhere. So um, we cannot really get by anymore to think we can hide anything. Um, data, is, data is out there. I think it's very important, though, to look at the ethical use, and, and that would revert to the organization that you work for and the principles that you that you stand and also being able to communicate correctly the type of information that's that's relevant and, and sensitivities around information and wait what time to release certain information i think those are important bits but the reality is information is out there um there's an eye in the sky uh, floating around there all the time uh, capturing information and we cannot get away from that anymore that is that is just a reality so true, Philip. I think I would agree. Um, and I, I think a similar question uh, from seniors on uh, have you seen these remote sensing tools being adversely used? Uh, how do you ensure it's used for good intentions? Uh, I guess, uh, Philip, you've covered it, but uh, anybody else you want to share your thoughts on that as well? Uh, Wim, go ahead. Yeah, that's kind of an interesting example. Uh, back in 2015, we started uh, applying the flash environmental assessment tool uh, for our research on Syria. So we took the, the feed model and applied it to cities and looking at um, how it could impact like uh, risks of, of contamination. And I had a discussion back then with one of the designers of the, the feed uh, tool. And he was sort of frightened when we mentioned we were going to apply the feet which was made for humanitarian uh, context and to a conflict context because his concern was that uh, you know non-state actors would immediately know where all the locations were where all the chemicals were stored because the feet we would use basically what we did in Syria we looked at Aleppo and Homs and other cities and looked at okay what kind of there's a solvent industry and there's, so there's a textile industry a lot of solvents there's like PCB contamination risk or chemical risk uh, and then we use the feet to, uh, to see what kind of uh, chemicals were present there and uh, so his, that back then when we sort of brought these two together and it's really great to see that uh, organizations like REACH and others and and, um, and we worked later with uh, 2016 in Mosul with the Joint Environment Unit to do, make a similar thing for, for the Mosul uh, um, response um, that uh, there was his concern like so non-site actors would know that but the, the problem is or the problem like if we can do it other people can do it as well it's out there the, the feed tool was out there uh, the, the information on where locations are that can store hem hazardous chemicals you probably make it easier for them but if you already are an actor that's interested in those kind of things you probably already know where you can find those kind of uh, 
uh, chemicals uh, if you combine those sources. And the same thing was around the mapping we did on makeshift refineries in Syria. Um, so we made a sort of whole map of uh, using satellite imagery of where the makeshift refineries were, a lot of, which were operated by a lot of the times by civilians, um, where those were uh, because of the uh, environmental health risk for people working in it. And some people also said like, well, that can easily be used as a targeting list by uh, either the Russian or Syrian Air Force or the coalition forces. Um, but then again, yeah, states probably already have that data as well. It's like, we just use like the open source data and to, to map these. Uh, in the worst case, you could say, well, you make it, you do the work for them because you make it easily to target those. And, and uh, by the way, it was, it's illegal to target those facilities because they're all, most of them civilian operated um but yeah it's you know it's uh it's usually those kind of arguments are just used by states to limit access to satellite imagery because they don't like other people to to see what they're doing it's also because also at the same time with bellingcat we use a lot of the open source data to uh to m map and monitor conflicts to demonstrate how states are violating international humanitarian law or committing war crimes uh or non-state groups are committing war crimes by using all this data. So of course, states don't, don't like that. It's, it's a growth also of, of sort of public intelligence, um, which is making use of open source and remote sensing to bring it together. So I'm not really convinced by these arguments that people can use it in an adverse way. Of course, they can use it in an adverse way, but that's uh, that's not for me, no argument not to use it um, because like, yeah, they're, and I think the threat, for example, with ISIS misusing open source data, I think that's, uh, there are other things to concern around if that kind of group is already active uh, and even limiting the beneficial things of having open source data like remote sensing data that can actually help uh, understanding what they're doing and how to respond to what they're doing. Absolutely, well, great, great insights. Totally agree with you on that one. Uh, thanks. And, and Greg, I have a very quick question for you. Um, if I have to project five years into the future, where do you see the open source development is heading towards? I, I see that you have already made a lot of progress in making these data accessible, very easy even for non-geospatial persons. Uh, what's, what's going to be next there? At the moment, the data are there, and then we need someone to look into that, right? You have machine learning algorithms, which if you tweak them perfectly, you will get like some results of the analysis. This is already now. Where I see it in the future is that um, the machine learning will kind of uh, be in the role of active monitoring, uh, where uh, there will be an automatic process which will be checking all this data because there's simply too much of it to look into everything, right? I mean, even if everyone looks into it, there's still too much of it. Uh, so there will be machine learning process which will look into it, hopefully find, I don't know, let's say new uh, oil leaks or um, whatever, right? The, the, the deforestation uh, uh, events and then trigger some um, hopefully actions to someone, to some teams that they could actually do something on the ground. I mean, we have to understand that what we are looking here is still just the data about what is happening in the world. I hope that this data will become um, really, will become a kind of a transparent view into what's happening because in, in today worlds of a fake news, this is super important, right? That we have something I mean, God forbid that we will come into a situation where people wouldn't trust the satellite data. We are not there yet, but it may happen, right? Because you can uh, manipulate it, same as everything else. Uh, but I, this is why I think it's so important to have these tools in place that transparently show the data. And uh, then, yeah, machine learning will just do it ma its magic and will start finding things that we do now, I don't know, find after years maybe of happening because just nobody looked into it. Oh, thanks, Greg. So what I'm hearing is I probably have to start looking for some other field to work in. Soon my job would be automated a little bit there. <laughs> but that's great. That's great news. No, James, no, I'm, no, uh... no, no, no. That's not... <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm is... kidding. I know, but still it's important. The brains will still guide all these things, right? I mean, of course, all Absolutely. The, the machine learning doesn't do anything if you don't understand what's happening there. That's a great point. And also linking to some of the points Vanessa made earlier as well in thinking about what the obligations are, how to use it, link it to policies. I think we, we definitely need a human there. Uh, James, I would also, uh, sorry, I, I missed your hand up there uh, a moment ago. Would you like to come in and, and give your perspective? Just on the, the two questions previously mentioned around the sensitivities. Um, I think yeah, that definitely there are 
uh, some cases where we're tasking satellites to specific areas of interest um, and uh, capturing imagery um, for, for specific emergency uh, and also high resolution imagery at you know, 30 centimeter, 40 centimeters, specifically in displacement contexts where there's vulnerable population and informal sites with no protection uh, set up yet. In these cases, um, Reach and, and our, one of our partner, UNICEF, that we're, we're sharing this information bilaterally first to the humanitarian response to that UN agency um, with secure servers, login details for that type of high resolution and um, displacement context, just so it's not always publicly available uh, information. Um, and then two on the Eastern Ukraine front, um, we're actually, in the feed example, as, as Wynn mentioned, we're actually trying to take this forward to both sides, right? So the OSCE and, and Geneva Call and these other actors are actually trying to actively engage both uh, uh, militaries and volunteer groups to make them aware about uh, these hazards, these chemical hazards, these industrial facilities, um, and that shared concern to both population groups on, on, on both sides of the contact line because they have a shared environment, a shared water source, um, and they're impacted by a lot of the same networks of these industrial facilities. So it's actually, we're, we're trying to bring it forward um, as a topic. I just wanted to share those two points as well. Thank you, James. Uh, Wim, oh, can I quickly call upon uh, you to, to have a remark? Yeah, just uh, to quickly also respond on the question on the on, on the ICRC, but also broader. I think what we've seen now the last couple of five years by all the work that the uh, REACH and IMAP and um, and we've done through Bellingcat and other organizations has done on remote sensing and has also scoping the the impact and demonstrating, visualizing and quantifying the environmental dimension of armed conflict. And that's something that's been new because it helps. Uh, it helped uh, putting the environmental uh, concern and, and and in response the the impact it has on civilians on the policy map. Because before it was only after conflicts where environmental assessments were, were done, and that sort of slowed down the the process of uh, unless there was like a huge incident, like for example the Kuwait oil fires, where everyone could see like six hundred burning oil wells. That's the issue, um, but now there are so more uh, slow onset issues, or uh, for example, like the destruction of crop fires in Syria, or water issues that's currently happening in the example that uh, that Philip gave uh, in in, uh, in northern Syria or in Iraq, where you can actively already demonstrate uh, what the issues are. We can predict impacts, and we can already take that forward into policy discussions uh, and response discussions. So that thing, in that sense, uh, remote sensing and, and earth observation has enormously helped pushing forward, uh, putting the environmental dimension of conflict on the political agenda uh, by almost immediate uh, responses or visualization of those kind of impacts and where um, uh, initiatives like Sentinel Hub has been a major uh, influencer uh, in changing that debate because uh, going back to the 16 year old when we were getting lessons from you, we still had to go to the uh, the, the NASA website and manually download all the Landsat data to for use. And now it's like immediately it's available and, 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 and with organizations like Planet also making stuff more medium resolution and sometimes high resolution available. There's such a rapid response and it helps also putting a pressure uh, on, on governments and militaries to know like people are watching, uh, humanitarians can immediately access that. They know to, to do better planning, better response work. And I think that's uh, I think the added value of, uh, of of remote sensing and earth observation that that made an enormous leap in the last five years. So I think uh, feeding that back to, uh, to the question for Vanessa, I think that's uh, a clear indication of how it helps accountability and transparency over uh, military activities and their and their impacts. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank, thank you, Wem. Thanks for sharing. Uh, I see that we're a wee bit past time, but um, I think most of you, if not all of you in the participants would agree how fascinating this has been to see applications of remote sensing in GIS, but addressing into the humanitarian needs. Uh, personally, I am a strong believer that technology will be a key part of this bigger solution we need uh, to, to address all these complex challenges that we are facing. So uh, from facts, IMAP and REACH uh, working directly, utilizing these resources and bringing these compelling evidence to, to wider audience, wider decision maker, uh, and synergize making these complex technologies more accessible and ICRC's take on the legal obligation. I think it has been a 
fantastic, great evening of, of learning and sharing. Uh, personally, I learned quite a bit from you all. Uh, I remain curious to see where the next few years would take us. And Philip, I'm not going to lose my job. I was just kidding. Um, but with new improvements in the field from machine learning to use of drones, I think um, this is the perfect time to be in this field, actually. Uh, so a big, big thank you to all the panelists. Thanks for joining us. And at some point, we had well over 120 participants, which is fantastic, uh, who were able to tune in today. Uh, I hope you all have a good rest of the day and keep doing the great work there. Have a great evening. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Keep up. Bye. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining. Thanks. Bye.